My name is Sofia Victorino, I'm Head of Education and Public Programs here at Whitechapel Gallery and this is the second in a series of events organised in collaboration with After All and, uh, and this uh, series of talks was really uh, prompted by After All publication series on exhibition histories and also uh, by the Whitechapel own history of exhibition making um, and of course together with our common uh, desire to create a context in which to expand on these conversations. So the aim of each talk um, is to look at and in a way contextualize a number of exhibitions uh, through personal accounts of curators that uh, played a crucial role in defining the field. So it is of course my great pleasure to introduce uh, this evening Lucy Lippard, uh, a key figure in shaping the landscape of uh, exhibition making, art criticism, publishing uh, over the past decades as you all know, uh, both as a writer, a political activist, a feminist and a curator uh, and I would say whose work work has profoundly influenced a uh, huge generation of younger artists and curators. Um, Lucy Lippard will be in conversation with another Lucy, Lucy Steeds. Uh, Lucy Steeds is editor at After All Exhibition, at After All work and has worked it extensively on the book uh, From Conceptualism <laughs> to Feminism. Uh, Lucy Lippard's number shows and um, uh, they will be focusing on three uh, main exhibitions uh, as a starting point for a broader discussion on art production, distribution and reception. Uh, the first one, uh, uh, or the first two ones are from the numbers shows, uh, the Seattle Art Museum Pavilion in 69 and um, uh, the Vancouver Art Gallery in 1970, uh, and on a more recent one um, entitled Weather Report, Art and Climate Change uh, at the Boulder Museum in Colorado. So this will be like the starting point for a uh, broader discussion. Uh, on a brief biographical note, I would just like to mention that uh, in the 1960s, Lucy Lippard began contributing to publications such as Art International and later Art Forum. In 66, she organized eccentric uh, abstraction at the Fishback Gallery in New York, and uh, this was, again, her first curatorial project um, and, uh, <laughs> and she'll talk more about the first first one uh, uh, in a while uh, and um, in 1968 she co-authored with John Chandler the seminal article The Demetrialization of Art uh, published in Art International and I think it's important to mention that in 69 uh, which is the year of the first number shows Lucy Lippard was involved in founding the Art Workers Coalition in New York and in 1976 she was also involved in created printed matter uh, in terms of her trajectory, I think it's also very interesting to mention her early involvement with MoMA, uh, right after graduating, uh, working in the library, and later on through her writings, <laughs> published in several of the MoMA uh, catalogues. Um, Lucy, as you know, has written extensively over the years, um, and her books uh, include essays in art criticism, I will not mention all of them, uh, but uh, feminist essays on women's art, um, the lure of the local, uh, on the beaten track, um, and down country, the tono of the Galisteo Basin, uh, which is one of the most recent ones. Uh, and this year you've probably heard of the exhibition that the Brooklyn Museum has organized, um, which basically uh, drew uh, on uh, Lucy Lippard's book, uh, Six Years, and uh, it was called uh, the show Materializing Six Years, uh, Lucy Lippard and the Emergence of Conceptual Art. And in a way, it ad addressed the impact of her book using I its context to create the structure and framework of the exhibition, uh, bringing together uh, the artists that she <coughs> featured as well uh, in that book. Um, now, Lucy Steed, she is, as I mentioned, the After All Exhibition Histories uh, editor, and she co-leads the Exhibition Studies pathway of the Master of Research in Art at Central St. Martins. Uh, she is also the lead author of the latest book in the After All series, which offers a reappraisal of the 1989 Paris exhibition Magicien de la Terre. And uh, Lucy has also background in exhibition making, having worked for six years in Arnolfini in Bristol, uh, and she holds a doctoral degree in cultural studies from Goldsmith. Meets. So the conversation will last about 15 minutes, that we, then we'll open up to the floor for questions. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
so. Yes, you'll, you'll lead the way. But I will just like to remind you that as in a way this event also celebrates the publication, Lucy very kindly agreed to be signing some copies uh, at the end of the conversation in the cafe. Uh, so I'd like briefly to thank Lucy Steeds, Pablo La Fuente, Louise, Lynn Elgard from After All, and Nicholas Sim from the White Chapel Gallery for all their uh, enormous efforts in organizing this event. And of course, I would like to express my enormous thanks to Lucy Lieber to accept uh, sharing her experience with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I'm afraid I have prepared a few words, and I've also scripted them, only because Lucy Lippard is so beautifully careful with words, I was too intimidated to wing it completely at the start. Um, and I have a few thanks to make, so um, bear with me. First of all, everybody at White Chapel that's made it possible, and also to my colleagues at After All, and to those from the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam who brought Lucy to Europe for an event on Sunday. I just want to add some um, brief, broader thanks to the extended community involved in, involved in After All's Exhibition Histories project. Lucy actually made a vital contribution to our work early on when she spoke memorably at the Symposium on Conceptual Art and its exhibitions that we organised in Vienna in 2008. This was the inaugural discussion event held under the Exhibition Histories banner with our partners, the Academy of the Fine Arts in Vienna, and the Van Abel Museum in Eindhoven, involved together with After All as part of St. St. Martin's here in London. In the book on Lucy's so-called number shows that ultimately resulted from that event, the third in the Exhibition History series, which came out recently and which we're launching here tonight, uh, we are happily joined by an important new partner, the Centre for Curatorial Studies at Bard College. So those are my institutional uh, acknowledgements, and I can now turn to our speaker. And I'll reiterate, I think, some of the things that um, Sophia said, but it's brief. Um, so it's my honour and pleasure to try again to put words around this. Uh, it's uh, also a challenge because summing up uh, Lucy Lippard's practice and picking which achievements to highlight is an almost impossible task. Lucy Lippard is a writer and an activist. And that's a careful quote from her recent writing, because, of course, <coughs> identifications change over time and vary with the person doing the identifying. So as a writer, as you've heard, she's been an art critic, an art historian, a columnist, and an author, by which I mean, in this instance, she's also written fiction. As an activist, she's described herself as a socialist feminist, and now equally important, perhaps, is her work with ecological and environmental concerns. And I'm hoping we might get to talk perhaps later. Well, that whole second show is about that. So. And I hope, I'm curious to know how they come together. Mm. Um, beyond writing and activism, I'm keen to flag her work as an editor, archivist, and of course on exhibitions, which brings us here tonight, the reason for us coming together tonight. The term curator wasn't used much or not for those putting together shows of contemporary art at the time of the early shows that we're about to discuss. Uh, these first two shows took place, as you've heard, in 69 and 70, and they were iterations of the same idea involving many of the same artists and same works or new versions of, of the same works. The exhibition Lucy titled 557087 took place in Seattle, which then had a population of that number or thereabouts. And this was reworked the following year in the larger city of Vancouver with the title 955,000, so almost double the potential local audience. Um, akin to the two shows we considered in the first book in the Exhibition History series, which took place very much at the same time, but in Europe, Lucy's Seattle and Vancouver exhibitions introduced and responded to the new art of the late 1960s. But one of the crucial distinctions of Lucy's shows is the number of works presented beyond the gallery walls and installed on the basis of instructions provided by artists rather than by artists themselves. <coughs> the more recent show we'll be discussing tonight also took place in North America. This is Lucy's latest curator curatorial project, which has already been named. It's Weather Report, Art and Climate Change. And it was open in Boulder, Colorado in 2007. And for what it's worth, courtesy of Wikipedia, 
The town of Boulder has a population of a little under 100,000. <laughs> so that's a fifth of those in Seattle <laughs> and a tenth of those in Vancouver. Uh, one of the key things that links Weather Report to Lucy's earlier shows is its presentation of art outside of spaces dedicated to arts display. Um, now, my knowledge of Lucy's Seattle and Vancouver shows draws on the editorial research for the After All book that we're celebrating tonight, and therefore on the work of many, in particular the lead author, Connie Butler, and on the picture research of my After All colleagues, Lena Elligard and Kate Stancliffe. But I also owe a debt of thanks to my MRES students in exhibition studies at Central St. Martins. I find that teaching, even more than writing, forces me to clarify, if not encapsulate my thoughts. And it was standing in front of a classroom that I got closest, I think, to understanding Lucy Lippard's practice in summary, but um, in coherent terms. I see her distinctive approach to exhibition making as that of an assembler, an assemblager, a galvanizer. And you can see I'm struggling for terms here. Ultimately, I settled on seeing her as a solder in the sense of making things happen through sol solidarity. And I guess I'm keen to see if there's any sense in which this characterization based on Lucy's Seattle, Vancouver, and immediately ensuing shows is helpful when we get to know weather report. But that's a question, and we'll come to those later. And I know Lucy's actually very generously prepared some work for us tonight. So. Well, I, I just, I, I wasn't sure how we were going to do this, so I, I wrote out a little introduction. I'm really much better reading my stuff than I am talking, so I will just... So this is the Lucy's, Lucy's hero. <laughs> the Lucy's hero. <laughs> and thanks very much to After All and Whitechapel for doing this. It's, Sounds like it's going to be fun. And we decided, Lucy and I, by email, before having met them, we were going to talk about the off-site uh, works in both shows, in the early shows and now, because that's really been my, I'm as interested in that as anything that was indoors. And I should repeat yet again that I don't see myself as a curator. I know this is not the moment to do that, but I've, <laughs> I've had no museum training in my sort of hands-off, hands-on, white gloves off approach, it tends to horrify museum personnel and professionals, which is why I'm much better off working with artists working beyond the institution. The sort of seat of, a pan of the pants approach worked well for the first of these number shows, which we've been mentioning, in Seattle and Vancouver. And the recent exhibition was, uh, I also had actually almost more works outside than inside. I'm not sure when museum shows, and I'd love if there's uh, some historian in the audience who knows this, when museum shows began to show works not only in the sculpture garden or right around the museum, but like off into the city and all over the place as we did in, in 557087 and 955000. I finally learned to say those again. Um, these, these may have been the first ones to, to like send works way out and they may not have whatever. Uh, I've spent years trying to escape the art world and being dragged back into it by various political concerns. And I'm devoted to the possibilities of temporary public art, which I think can create audiences for art, new audiences for art, and new places where art can be effective. And some of this work is subversive public art, not obviously art. I like the idea that people who may or may not be tempted to enter a museum are suddenly confronted in the course of their everyday lives with art that makes them think, if nothing more than, what the hell is this? My favorite pieces make people think about their geographic place, their place in society, and perhaps how the local relates to the global. But even when art isn't recognizable as such, it tempers lived experience. My favorite quote on this is, I use this all the time, is by Fluxus artist, Robert Fillou, who said, art is what makes life more interesting than art. So there's no reason to exaggerate the elusive power of art. Artists can't change the world alone. But with good allies and hard work, they can collaborate with life itself. Working with and between other disciplines and audiences, and given the chance to be seriously considered outside the rather narrow world of art, I think artists can offer visual jolts and subtle nudges and ask peculiar questions to familiarity itself and they can provide models for new approaches, asking questions without knowing the answers. The popular image of artists as renegades frees them to imagine situations beyond the boxes, and they can also deconstruct the ways we're manipulated by the powers that be and help open our eyes to what we have to do to resist and survive. So I thought what I'd do is just run through the slides, and Lucy can come in any time. I don't, I don't know if we're going to make this in 15 minutes, but we, that, that's something new. But anyway, um, we'll, and we'll just sort of discuss things as we go. And I warn you, 
that my memory of the good old days is kind of pale. People are always saying, you know, what about this, this, and this, and I don't remember. So anyway, <laughs> uh, all of these works are indicative of the pleasure and pitfalls of installing art beyond the safety of institutional boundaries. <coughs> so anyway, the first one is Roloff Lau. A wood, I'm just going to read the captions and then jump in when you feel like it, or, or actually anybody can. It's about 300 wooden slats scattered in lots of two to six at irregular intervals over an extensive area, and that's what I got as my instructions. They couldn't afford to bring the artists. This was a very low-budget show, like almost everything I've done. Um, so I was told to do it. I mean, it wasn't a conscious strategy or anything. It was just a necessity. The wood was stolen when it was shown in Seattle, and the piece was recreated in Stanley Park in Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> then there was Carl Andres. Can I jump in one yeah, second? Sure. Yeah. I, I wanted to flat this. So this is in Vancouver, and I don't know, we haven't found an image of it, the same work in Seattle. Yeah, well, it was stolen, so I, mean, I, don't, I don't know what they did with the wooden slats, but I don't think they recreated the piece. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, it's interesting that we're still, I, I, there's an archive letter that you, uh, a letter that's been found in the archive that you, um, is written to you and Cecil by Anne Fokker. Anne Fokker? Anne Folk, yeah. Anne Folk. And she just is going through a running report. I mean, you, I don't you know if well, she was my you. major assistant and she ended up by being the director of and or a really great alternative space in Seattle. Still a friend. Then. So the way she sort of glosses it having been stolen is to describe how the work is being dispersed by the gardeners with the help of a group of folk dancers who <laughs> use the garden on Saturdays. <laughs> um, I don't remember that. That's <laughs> lovely. Okay. So anyway, the next one is uh, Carl Andre's Timber Piece. And I'm afraid the after all book is wrong on this one. Uh, it was in Seattle, and I, when I did it, it's 20, it was called 28 units of timber. And timber to me meant timber like a log falling down. So I just figured it. So I went to a great deal of trouble to get the warehouser timber company, who actually are related to artists and have a huge art collection, and so on, to get raw timber. Made a very beautiful piece that went over the cusp of a hill. Uh, and when Carl saw it, he said, that's not my piece, that's your piece, because it was supposed to be cut lumber, which, I mean, I should have figured that out, but anyway. <laughs> and the drawing on the card is pretty accurate, so I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> so this is the catalog card by the artist. And it was, it was 28, uh, 28 logs end to end over the cusp of a hill. So anyway, and the, anything on that? <laughs> I, mean, I was just going to... Um, <coughs> Briefly, add that some of the work towards the book identified the sort of figures in these photographs. So we're looking here at the uh, Ian Baxter in the foreground, yeah. who was uh, another artist. Um, Nadia Pagonis and Chris Dickiakos, if there are any Canadians in the audience here, who was an artist from Vancouver, very young at the time. And the Latin, he's a student at the University of British Columbia, so I'm interested yeah. in what well, the, the show was in two places. It was at UBC Student Union, sort of, and, and also at the Art Gallery of Ontario at some sort of offshoot of it, I think. So, anyway. And I think this photo was actually taken by Ian Wallace, who was teaching at UBC at the time? Uh, he was around. I don't yeah. remember where he was teaching him. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the interesting things that's happened since the book came out is that the Vancouver Art Gallery has produced a microsite that has all their installation images um, ready to view online. So I'd encourage anybody interested in these images to look, to look no, there. I didn't know that. I, I know, we, can flick, we can look at it if, yeah. we, if we get there. Um, but it's interesting that all their images are institution yeah. bound. So well, the very talk you're doing today yeah. is kind of... Because in those days, of course, we didn't take pictures. I mean, yeah. not everybody had a camera. We certainly didn't have cell phone cameras. So taking a picture was a big deal. And there's a, an awful lot of the shows I've done just totally undocumented at all. And that's, and my memory being what it is, they've vanished from history, which is probably not a bad idea. No, no, it's a bad idea. And the fact that this microsite repli you know, replicates the idea that it's an inside show is you know, it's distressing. In fact, they mention a map. They say there's a map of the other side. Oh. We never found this map. This is what, you know. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah no, I'd love to have been. seen the map because some of them were very. Anyway, then there was Hans Hoffa's precipitation minus evaporation piece. This is at UBC in Vancouver. Every day at noon, the balance between precipitation and evaporation were measured and recorded and marked on the clear acrylic pipe. And did you did yeah. you put in that? Yeah. And here's the, the log, sort of, of the students or whoever it was that was. So again, that image that. was Vancouver. Still images of Seattle, but this is the chart from Seattle. So you can see the sort of shows working in parallel, developing. And and the show did change quite a bit. I added people in Vancouver who were Canadian and I just discovered quote. This is, Bill, this is Bill Bollinger's untitled contribution. It was a large log, another warehouser contribution, floating in open water. 
It must have been anchored. I, I no longer remember, but it, it, it's along a beach in Vancouver with seabirds sitting on it. They were grateful. <laughs> and the next one is Keith Arnott's mirror plug, which was, quote, a negative mirrors chamber on the lawn outside the Vancouver Art Gallery. Mirrors were a big deal, you know, that, of course, Bob Smithson thought he owned mirrors, and when <laughs> other people worked with mirrors, he was very annoyed. <laughs> uh, and this is another mirror piece, um, Ingrid and Ian Baxter, or anything company. Netco. Before we get to it, Lucy, do you mind if I oh, take no, back one yeah. quick thing on the um, on that, simply because again, we're in um, Vancouver here, but I gather from uh, Connie's research that in Seattle, this was installed in the backyard of a local collect collector and patron, so this is Anne Gerber. Yes, um, who, who I was staying with during this whole thing. Okay. Yeah. Who was the, actually the person who, who got this whole show going. She was, she was very annoyed at the sort of Green Bergie, and she was an older woman who was a collector, but a wonderful character. And she was annoyed at the Green Bergian kind of cast of the Contemporary Art Society, or whatever, put this on. And so she, she militated to get me to do something and came to New York and we talked about what. And so she was, Ann Gerber was really the, the, the two Anns, and Ann Folk was, was the one who made it happen, really. I mean, it was my, she was very young at the time, but she was my assistant, so-called. She really was invaluable. So anyway, then there was the, oh, that, that's the Netco thing. It was, uh, it's, it's VSI formula number five. VSI was visual sensitivity information. Um, and here we're in Seattle, actually. So this is one image yeah, that's from, yeah. the, from the first show. Um, and I, I, I think there was a photographic element inside the exhibition. I mean, it may have been. <laughs> so I think in the middle, that's what we're looking at. But uh -huh. everybody's quite hazy about what. But there were some pieces yeah. that made the connection. And Lucy can tell yeah, us more. I was going to like do the inside, outside thing. Did I put, um, what's the next one? Um, uh, here we are, so you can see what's going on. Yeah, so the next one was Smithson's Blue Pour, which was in Vancouver. We're kind of jumping around, which was, I did the outdoor pieces first, the things that were all basically out there and probably unseen by a lot of people. <laughs> anyway, the Blue Pour was a prototype for the famous asphalt pour, and um, it was, it was, I'd go to the next one, I think I put a color one on, yeah. It was really gorgeous, gloppy stuff of it, so. And then the inside, outside things, it's the next, the Smithson. This was another one of these things where Smithson wanted 400 square snapshots of Seattle horizons. And Seattle is full of hills, it's, you don't get Seattle horizons, so I, just drove madly around leaning out the window with my <laughs> brownie or whatever it was. And, and they were supposed to be empty, Smithson asked for empty, plain, vacant, surd, common, <coughs> ordinary, blank, dull, and level, which was virtually impossible in Seattle. So, so the, this is what came out of there. I don't think it made too much difference what they were anyway. But. So this is in Seattle, so this is, this yeah, is one I'm of the works that changed, but it's interesting because this actually yeah. changes between yeah, I the put two. This, well, I'm going inside, outside, but the, this was before the glue pour. So. But it's interesting. And Smithson was in Vancouver, but not in Seattle. That was the reason that I did it. So. But also, I, I, I'm curious to know how you respond to Connie's interpretation, that the sort of move for Smithson from this inside piece at Seattle outside to make glue pour was kind of significant in his practice. I, I don't think so by then. I mean, 69, he was already pretty much the site non-site stuff was yeah. already happening sort of okay. so, but but you know it, it was it was there and that was definitely part of his main part of his work and it's just I guess it's nice to say it's sort of encaptured with an exhibition so yeah that's yeah maybe I don't know <laughs> and then Daniel Buren this is one quick naughty thing I was you were, um, referenced the similarity between the Smithson and the Edru show so this is just the Edru show but I'm gonna move on the Buren. And this was the Buren indoors, and then we had green and white stripes. And then we can go on to the outdoor. I think there's an outdoor one. Yeah. And the, this is the director of the uh, Seattle Museum uh, doing it, uh, putting up thing, wheat pasting in the streets, which was kind of nice. Thomas Matham was his name. And in Vancouver, it was executed by nameless volunteers. And uh, Buren insisted that uh, it was not his personal work, but the work of several people, whether they were artists or not, whose names were in the catalog, including the director, associate director. So you could also say that Bob Barry's contribution was off-site and inside, or basically it was out of sight. Uh, his piece was, quote, all the things I know, but of which I am not at the moment thinking, which I always loved. <laughs> 
so we have no I'm just going to flash this up quickly. This is the, excuse me, to jump back to Buren from um, Barry, but this is the Vancouver um, <coughs> microsite, and it's just nice that they do, you can see all the images they have of the, of the Buren around and about, so it gives yeah, just some yeah. indication of the, I had of the spread across the city. Seen that. And then um, I don't have an image of this. Maybe you did Richard Archwager's bloops, BLPs, which were all over town. He said a bloop is in your mind. When you see a bloop, you recognize it as an image of the true bloop, which is in your mind. <laughs> it's sort of fun to see these guys at the Kurt Schwitter's show at the, at the Tate this afternoon, and mm -hmm. all those wonderful or sonata things. And, I mean, I, and I, one of these bloops lasted 30 years in Seattle in an underpass and was still there when Ann Folk looked last time, like which last <laughs> summer or something. So that's pretty good. I mean, that's for temporary art. But I was fascinated there outside because in the, uh, in when attitudes um, become formed, the bloops, it's great to you say the word, I've never pronounced it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have neither until this <laughs> moment. Um, and they were all contained, I think, yeah. within the Kunsthalle. So I, and because we didn't find photo documentation of them out in the yeah. world, I don't. I, mean, until I wonder if he did do them out there. I mean, he pro he liked to do that, so yeah. he probably did. Did so, just I mean, it's not known. Yeah. You know, so, I mean. yeah. And then John Baldus John Baldessari and, and George Nikolaidis, and I'm not quite sure who he was. I think he was another of the sort of Greek mafia in, in Vancouver. <laughs> we had a lot of Greeks helping <laughs> and and dancing, which was nice. So. Um, anyway, this was called 2,000 Ghetto Boundary Stickers. They were little silver things on telephone poles street signs, etc. The number of stickers was dependent on the size of the ghetto. And this was of course meant well, but would be very questionable today. I mean, who wants to think they're trapped in a, the boundaries of a ghetto? But, but it was sort of an interesting moment then, and not like the Baldessari we know. And then there was... Uh, but I think... Oh, no, moving. Yeah, oh, yeah, but it would, well, yeah, then Michael Heiser, which I don't have an image of proposed, and this never happened, a thousand pound displacement of dirt, 15 feet deep and 100 feet wide, replicating one that he'd made on his land in Nevada. That was definitely beyond us. And may have, I suspect it was intended to be beyond us, that he didn't really want me to do anything. <laughs> so anyway, now onto the, oh, and Randy Sims, which I don't have a picture of either. Uh, I think he was British. I, I, Randy Sims in the audience? <laughs> anyway. uh, but he, he um, I don't have a picture of it, it was a huge white arc, maybe as big as this stage, sprayed on, on a grove of trees. And in the image, it looks gorgeous, all very neat. But of course, when we tried it, it was just a huge mess. I mean, the white paint all over the place and the leaves fell. I mean, it was not a great success. And so. cursing, having got this image, so the image he's referring to is the sort of instruction that the artist sends, which is the, yeah, which the, is the card. Sort of a so nice. it's an artificially created. And, and I don't know if he'd ever tried to do it, but we sure as hell couldn't. <laughs> Anyway, now, 2007, this show was about issues rather than ideas, per se, which the other one was supposed to be. And I'm not sure we can talk about whether there's a difference in the approach to the public pieces and so forth, but there were 51 artists represented, 18 site-specific pieces all around the city. And uh, anyway, so this is by Yves André Lallemay. This was an uh, insert in, in the newspaper, in the Sunday paper, and it's uh, pretty vacant, named after a Sex Pistols song. And it was a public service announcement uh, with no explanation. It's about desertification in the West. And if you were in the West, you, you kind of had more of an idea of what it was about. Desertification actually caused by drought and climate change all over the world. And cultural attitudes toward the Western US as desert as sort of, as one military general put it, it's a good place to toss out used razor blades. We don't, those of us who live there don't feel that way, but uh, anyway. Then. And the next one is uh, Aviva Romani, who works entirely with computer stuff, which I can't really explain. She works on the ground uh, on a main island, at which she started out by actually restoring an old uh, gravel quarry. And then she, now she's in cyberspace. She uses the internet to, quote, perform virtual residencies without the international travel that spews jet fuel over the Earth's waters. I got here that way. Her expensive work, I mean her uh, expansive work <laughs> called trigger points, not, not at all expensive, trigger points or tipping points, looks at the way local change can have global effect. And she does podcasts, she did them from Boulder all the way through the show. And then Meryl Letterman Euclides did, uh, distributed the top part of this collage, Dear Children, Can You Forgive Us? 
to schools all over Boulder, and the kids, obviously elementary schools, and then the kids ex exhibited, painted the rest of it in, or did the rest of it, and she exhibited hundreds of them in the public library, which is really kind of a wonderful sight. They were all over the place. And she had, of course, her grandchildren in mind. And the next one is Isabella Gonzalez. Uh, two cents worth. She had been told somewhere that the ozone layer was about this two pennies thickness. It apparently was not quite right, but anyway. But, and it's called two cents worth. Your participation is required. And it was also shown in a local credit union as well as the museum where people had no idea what it was all about. But they, they, there were postcards involved. And, and then Bobby Beasel, the next one, uh, has worked for a long time with Plugheads, his performance piece. They appear in public spaces all over the place. They still show up in Santa Fe with, when Jim Henson, the great climate change uh, originator, I mean, the person who really brought the issue up first in the States, he, they were there when he spoke a couple of weeks ago. In Boulder, they led up, I think this is another slide, they, they led a procession or a performance for the Dia de, de los Muertos, or Day of the Dead, utilizing humor and art and ritual. Our future farmers, Amy Franceschini and, and uh, her collaborators, also did a performance piece in, in public in Boulder, which I didn't actually see because it happened before I got there, but I gather it was successful. And then Brian Collier did the pika or pika alarm. I've never, it's a, it's a cute little animal, the tiny voice of a small alpine animal who may be one of the first species to go extinct due to global warming. And it's it's caught in a climbing ecosystem. When it reaches the top, there's no great for them to go. And this was had a little cry at the top of the uh, pole, little amplifier. So you read about, you saw a picture, of the and you read about it, and then you heard this little, oh, <laughs> this pathetic little thing. <laughs> and then Lynn Hull, that's there. There's the top. Lynn Hull uh, is known for her trans. In the next one, for her trans species art. She's, she's worked by making habitats for wildlife. And she, she there's this wildlife sign, and, she, and the next one, she also installed these cooler choice stickers all over the place, where a choice is indicated, bikes or buses, instead of cars, changing light bulbs, and so forth. Then Marguerite Carl, the next one, her homeland insecurity, she's American, lives in northern Italy was artificial hemp plants and a sort of subliminal sound installation that you were supposed to not, not know you were hearing. I don't know quite how that worked. I, I couldn't hear it. But the, uh, this piece was right at the museum entrance. And it looked like decorative landscaping until you finally got this message, which dealt with the hundreds of hemp products that could save energy were it not for the petroleum industry lobbying that keeps the unnatural products in place. Then Sherry Wiggins did, uh, this was a, a big, probably as, almost as big as the screen or as big as the slide, installed in parks. They were little sort of mini exhibitions in parks and they called carbon portraits. Uh, and they were the narratives from local and famous, that is Julia Roberts, um, famous individuals interviewed about their carbon footprint. People were interviewed to find out exactly, probably, how much carbon they used per And this day. is one poster we're looking at? And this is one of them, right. yep. This is one, and then there were several of them. Then Jane McMahon, the next one. This was a very complicated piece. She built a shelter in a park along Boulder Creek for what she, Arapaho Glacier, what goes around comes around. And the Arapaho Glacier is the, the main source of water for Boulder. And this chunk of ice was made of glacier water from the creek, but it was on life support. So ironically, it was kept frozen by solar panels. The piece underlined the necessity of both human and technological intervention to maintain the health of the planet. And then Mary Miss, this is almost <laughs> Mary Miss, and I think, oh, sorry, what did I do with Greg? Oh, Janet um, Koenig and Greg Schilletz, this is called Cannibal Tech. And it offered, is there, is there another one of, of this? Is it the one after that? No, never mind, go back to that. There was a, a, something I, go ahead and back to the next, yeah. They were, they were mounted on a, a very ugly pile of old discarded computers covered with plastic. I mean, it was really an eyesore. And then this beautiful poster was part of it. It uh, offered this intentionally ugly sculpture and a striking graphic about carbon emissions from computers and how they affect the human body, which means we're all rotting or something. 
And Jane, I don't see Jane I did. And then Mary Miss. I think this was the most effective piece. I use this all the time to show what you can do in terms of sort of broad communication. It was called Connect the Dots. And it mapped the high water hazards in the history of Boulder Creek. And it marked with paint can covered size, uh, they, I mean, they were paint can covers, so uh, blue dots <laughs> all around town of the level of the potential floods due to climate change. And it was in a high school and it was along the creek and it was in the streets and people came to sort of realize what they were seeing. And then there were just too many, to, uh, no, that's, that's they were very distinctive and very simple and it worked. Uh, the next, I'm just going to run through these. This was Chrissy Orr. She worked with a hydrologist to make this watershed map of local stones. This is Basha Erland. She did a long time project called Gathering of Waters, which she's done in various states. I think she did one in England as well, working with hydrologists along Boulder Creek. The, well, I should say that one of the, the ideas of this show was to have artists working with scientists which doesn't always work, but in this case, a, a woman named Marta Kern who runs an eco group in Boulder made me do this show. I mean, she's an old friend and I didn't want to do a show and she made me, <laughs> so, and I was really glad she did because it was fun. But anyway, the idea was that Boulder is full of scientific institutions, national labs for atmospheric research and so forth, and so there was a, a really a lovely reservoir of scientists to work with, and the artists could choose. And a lot of them still work with some of these people. Anyway, the next one was Christine Smock. She's a very funky artist. This was a Our Lady of Transformation and Renewable Energy. Each thing is made of scrap rebar and recycled materials. This was the most monumental piece, and it was at the National Center for Atmospheric Research by Melanie Walker and George Peters, called Coal Warm Memorial, sitting on the grounds, as I said, of the research center. And it's a wind sculpture grounded in lumps of coal that created a tunnel of sound and light, proposing the replacement, obviously, of dirty fossil fuels with wind power. And there were a number of other, next one, I guess, a number of other site, really impressive site-specific projects that had already taken place elsewhere that I just documented in the sort of front of the show. Uh, one of which was this one, uh, Rapid Response. This was done in 1999, a long time before the show. A group of artists and designers and architects from New York, including I think the best known is probably Peter Fend, took over an old gas station and promoted their, their brand Rapid with warming, warnings about warming. And others who were just documented were Britain's Cape Farewell, Pierre Hugg, uh, Javier Cortada, Marietta Potrick, Shai Zakai, you can tell her from all over the place, Joel Sternfeld, Buster Simpson, Andrea Poli, Natasha Mayers, Patrick Merrill, Inigo, Manglano Ovalle, Learning Site, Agnes Dennis, Center for Land Use Interpretation, Precipice, Precipice Alliance, and so forth. Anyway, there was, and then there was all the stuff, of course, in the museum itself. Um, my favorite of, of all the directly activist things is the Yes Men, their uh, Exxon Vivoleum. I don't know if you've seen that. They are amazing, I guess, performance activists. Uh, they posing as uh, Exxon Mobil and National Petroleum Council representatives. They spoke at Canada's largest oil conference, touting the virtues of Vivoleum, which was a way to commemorate those dying from climate change by <coughs> making candles energy from their corpses. You had all these businessmen listen to this, yeah, and then the candles were held out, and they thought they were burning human fuel. I mean, it was kind of extraordinary. The yes men are so good that they just get these people to do this. So this outrageous proposal was only gradually recognized as, quote, art or a hoax by the attendees. They solemnly lit their candles. So anyway, that and then there was all the stuff inside. Um, I always go over where the museum finally said, stop, stop, stop. It's a small museum. But there were 29 women and 12 men and 10 collaborations included. And the preponderance of women was an accident, excuse me. I didn't count until it was all decided, but nobody believes that. <laughs> anyway, it makes up for the lousy women's representation in the first numbers show that I did earlier. So, and the old flash flood, one more, I think there's one more. This was something we did in, in Santa Fe uh, about three or four years ago. About 1,500 people participated. It was a 350.org, the Climate Change Organization, International Climate Change Organization project. And Everybody turned out with blue things over their heads, and we, the Santa Fe River is totally dry, and so we put 
blew her water into the Santa Fe River. It was photographed from helicopters and stuff, but it was a wonderful piece. Of real, and we had, because it was New Mexico, we had mariachi dancers, mariachi bands on one side and Indian buffalo dancers on the other side. Who was so. the artist too? Hmm? Who was the artist too? There's no artist. It was a it was it was something you initiated. It. No, no, I didn't have anything to do. I mean, I was there with the blue thing with a bat mat on my head, but otherwise. <laughs> So, anyway, so that, that's it. Okay. <laughs> Great, thank you. I hope I got through that fast enough so we can still... Uh, no, I'm going to, don't worry, I'm going to only ask a, possibly even a single question because I will, might call you with other questions later, but I appreciate that we've got people here who have questions too. I think I really want to get clear in my mind to what extent you saw this, the curatorial project, not this one, the weather report, as an activist exhibition or as an activist project for you? Oh, totally, yeah. I mean, it was inspired by an activist. Uh, the art museum was sympathetic. They had a sympathetic director. Now they don't. He hates to have this even brought up and so forth. So, yeah, it was it was a decidedly active. But, of course, the art was was good art. I mean, there's no, there's no contradiction between act. I don't have to point this out to you, I hope, but there's no contradiction between good activist art and good art, period. And, it was uh, the indoor part of the show was was lovely too, but I'm I'm more interested in I, I'm I'm wondering and I don't know if you have any insights or anybody else does about exactly you know what the difference is between these the outdoor pieces at the time when very few people did outdoor pieces <coughs> way outdoors and and this this one obviously it's just par for the course now so so I'm, I'm going back to your question when the, yeah. where the history of, of putting things outside worked and I think you know you're uh, yeah I, I, I keep waiting for somebody to say you know that you was, weren't first that was, <laughs> no I, I don't even need to be first but I'd just sure. like to know when it was because things crept out I mean of course people had done things outside I mean there was land art and there was Klaus Oldenburg did his grave piece uh, near the Metropolitan Museum in Central Park and so it wasn't like nobody had worked outdoors but I, I'm just no, no, I just don't remember another show that that went out that far, sort of. I mean, it was a 30-mile radius, I think, in Seattle or something. No, and this is why. So, it was, yeah, it was and that was why I, I enjoyed doing that and still do. So. But of course, the trouble is you never get any real feedback. I mean, what I'm dying to know is whether people hate this stuff or not. And, as art, uh, or, as or love it, or or just walk by it, or whatever. And but if it's activism, you also have to measure it in terms of its agency. Or yeah, well, I have to know whether people are affected by it, and that's something you just basically don't know. A lot of artists I know who work outdoors uh, say, "Oh, it was very effective." Ten people came up to me and said they were moved by it. Well, that's lovely, but that may be a very small percentage of the people who saw it. <laughs> and I, I wish there were a way of doing more monitoring. We had a sheet in the Boulder Museum asking people which pieces they liked best and why. But they, but they just did it in terms of the indoor work. And this relies on people going to indoor work. Yeah, and yeah and which I, you know, that wasn't really what I had in mind, but there's no work. You can't really pin a sheet up next to every piece or something. And mm. would have been some deranged homeless guy was tearing pieces down, and I guess we know who he thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, the... the um, feedback you got on the early shows is probably almost overwhelming. I know when we first sent you the copy of this book, you said you felt that your, your name was on the wrong bit of the cover. Yes, I like to be at the bottom of the cover. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, you probably know, it, it, exhausted by people's interpretations of, of these early shows, but I guess um, in order to relate the, the Seattle and Vancouver shows to this later work, I'm thinking more about the trajectory of the number shows as such, moving from Seattle mm -hmm. and Vancouver and the sort of new art practice too. Mm -hmm. so well, they were, the number shows didn't, the first two shows were really the, almost the same show. I mean, they were and they weren't, but uh, they were the, the same effort. But the other two shows, I, I didn't, the same people weren't in any of them. The other three, two, two <coughs> shows. One in Buenos Aires, which was people I sort of found out about after these shows had gone down. And then the women's one in circa 7400, which which actually went all over the place. And here activism comes to the fore just to yeah, the extent it came, that women came, came here. I mean, but the, the other shows didn't travel. I mean, it would have, except for Vancouver, which had already. I mean, Anne Folk and her boyfriend took took the whole Seattle show over the in a in a minivan. Uh, it looks like a huge show and everything, but they took it over the border and they had to persuade them it was art. They said, like, this you know this rope and glue and I mean just a bunch of junk back there and they said, no it's this is an art exhibition and so on but that couldn't be done any other I mean you could have done the whole thing as in I didn't make a big deal out of this instruction thing which other people have been making a big deal out of but 
I mean, as I say, it was a necessity more than anything, but I guess we could have done a, a show completely that had to be built at the t in the place. I wouldn't have had to be there. Nobody would have had to be there. Just say, make these pieces. I don't think that ever quite got done. If, if it did, let me know. But I mean, if anybody else did that. But, but the this whole instruction thing was kind of fun for a while. <laughs> I mean, it just, yeah, it made the exhibition in Buenos Aires possible in the extent that you weren't there. Well, though, yeah, the, but those were all artist pieces. They, that wasn't really, I mean, the okay. artists just sent pieces mostly. I don't think okay. they were, I don't think that was outdoors at all. I'm not sure. The photographs we have in the book are internal again, yeah. but we don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't think there was anything there. Okay. Right, one final question for me before I open it to the floor. I just want to ask about the extent to which you're, ty you're committed or interested in the word exhibition as such, as opposed to, for instance, project or curatorial project or just project so but I don't you know I, I, as I say I, I do not see myself as a curator it's, it's something that every now and then something seems to want to be done or I want to do it or whatever but I really when I say I've curated I say in my biography that I've curated over 50 exhibitions that's true but uh, that includes things in union halls things in women's bathrooms I mean you know I mean it's 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 I think only three have been in museums at all uh, well, there was one in Cleveland or someplace, but three or four in museums. But for the most part, they've been very uh, alternative kind of exhibitions. Which is, I wonder whether the project allows it to be more alternative, even with, in the absence of the word curatorial as the mm -hmm. preface. So in I mean, the, I don't ca care about it, but I just, okay. it, since I'm basically a writer, I, I don't, I don't want to be boxed into sort of a curatorial. Okay. Thing, yeah, but, understood. Yeah. Yeah, sure. All right, I'm going to open up the floor. Who wants to start with questions? So you, you oh, I think, can you wait for the microphone? Excuse me. <laughs> it's being recorded, so it's just much easier if um, it's being recorded, and then I get to look at it and decide if I made a fool out of myself, and then we won't send it out. Does he you singled out the very Miss pieces as a work you thought was very effective? And I, I would suggest that that's perhaps because it. It was quite a beautiful piece. Yes, exactly. Which is yeah. not something you could say about a lot of the other works. In fact, the first one where the, the, the timber got stolen, I would suggest perhaps the people who stole it actually thought they found it and didn't even recognize um, this as a, an artwork at all. Yeah. And I think, you know, you, can you say something about the importance of, of aesthetics in, mm. in art making? I mean, I think if something is beautiful, even if it's the terrible beauty that Yates talked about, it still helps to grab people's attention. And with the Merry Miss, I'm sure a lot of people thought these are wonderful, these blue dots, and then it's quite a shock when they realize the sinister implication exactly, of, yeah. of those blue dots. And she worked very hard. I mean, in a funny way, she probably could have put them anywhere because they were so beautiful. Um, she, she was in her blue period. I mean, Mary tends to, <laughs> she does you know, lots of public projects, and she did a, a, a park in Santa Fe, which I had a lot to do with. Um, and, and there were there were blue things at that point. She was in her blue period, but they really did look great. Yeah, I think beauty is, is definitely a part of it. You know, the the book I've just finished and still gathering bits and pieces for is um, is called Undermining, and it's about the politics of land use in the West. It's kind of a collage, kind of an artist book sort of thing. It's a weird item, um, but. Uh, I, I say in that about landscape photography, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion about whether something that's beautiful that is Cancer Alley in Louisiana or something, Richard Mizrak's work, um, whether that's, it should be that way. And I'm sort of mixed about that. I think that, you know, the, the, the beauty is great because it makes people interested in it. And so a lot of Shabankar Banerjee, he was in this weather report show, who works in the Arctic and sees himself as an activist before an artist, really, but his photographs are stunning. But anyway, I think they have to be conscious of the flip side, which is the brutality of the situation. And I, I have uh, the illusion, anyway, that that comes through somehow in the work. Now, you have somebody like Sebastião Salgado, who many people just adore. I think that is wildly overstated and much too melodramatic. And even though he does show terrible things happening to people, uh, they, it's made so beautiful. That, and when it's people, it seems a little bit different than when it's landscape and so on. But I don't have any major theories about that, but it certainly is a question. I mean, I look at something and I think, no, that's too beautiful. And then I can't really explain to myself why I feel that that is, you know, 
not not the right thing to do in this situation. The Salgado, I, I just think, are sort of melodramatic, but they, they are stunning photographs. I but I'm not sure they do a favor to the people who are starving in them. I was just going to say quickly, the, the piece um, is also very effective because it's totally distributed across the city, and it's the fact that it does that. That's it works through being dispersed. What? Which bit? The, the, the mist. The mist, yeah. Yeah, yeah I so mean, it was in five It's responding very specifically to yeah, the... Yeah, yeah. And it was hydrologically, I mean, Mary is a, a very accurate, and so it was hydrologically completely correct. I mean, she worked with hydrologists and so on. So, so uh, and I don't know if people, you know, they read about this in the paper and stuff, so they, they would have some idea that she knew what she was doing and not just popping up blue things around. But, but uh, yeah, but I mean, I think, I think beauty is very important, and sometimes ugliness is very important. I mean, it really just depends on what you're doing. I mean, they could be blips, right? Only they have this. Yeah, they could be blips. <laughs> Only they have an yeah. well issue as well. Another question. Thank you. I had a question about the, uh, your, the way that the, the notion of outside worked in the context of Vancouver and Seattle. I mean, I've been living in London for many years, but I would consider myself a Vancouverite. And, uh, outside is often nature in Vancouver and it's a very kind of problematic sort of space because it's so mythologized. The, the, mo the, uh, the official motto of the province is supernatural British Columbia. So things just aren't outside, they're in this kind of like entrenched mythological nature and, and Seattle's quite similar. So I guess I wondered to what extent does the specific outsides of those particular West Coast cities actually factor into these exhibitions in some way? Well, actually, Boulder is the same kind of place. It's in the foothills of the Rockies. It's gorgeous. It's hiking. It, it's funny because, I mean, I, I, I wanted these things in the city. I mean, they were in, in Vancouver, they were in parks. I mean, in Boulder, they were in parks, too, but they were tended to be parks. city parks yeah. rather than anything else. But I, I wrote a whole diatribe a, a few years ago for there's a, a very wonderful land art course, Land Art in the West course at the University of New Mexico and another one that used to be in Texas and now it's in love with the Texas Tech. But anyway, they take kids, kids, anyway, young artists out um, for six weeks camping and going to outdoor sites. And at first it was just sort of land art. And then it finally became more about land use and more natural sites, unnatural sites, as well as art sites and so forth. But, uh, but I wrote this thing saying, I live in a rural place and I look out at mountains. And I started trying to think about what kind of art I'd like to see in my village. It's, it's a village of 250 people, so it's not large, it's very rural. And, and the nature is paramount, sort of. I mean, it's New Mexico, it's a little brown building, it's not too much eyesore stuff. But, but, uh, and I realized I didn't want to see any public art in my village <coughs> at all. <laughs> we do have some water tanks that it wouldn't be a bad idea if, if um, I had an idea for somebody to do something on the water tanks that would be more interesting than the football team, which we don't have anyway. So, uh, but then I realized then it was, gonna, it was getting into a whole hassle about who did that. I mean, you know, this guy or that woman or whatever. And so it just got to be too much. But I, I must say, I prefer my nature. I like things that are, you know, that you come upon suddenly. I mean, there was a, a guy named Zane Fisher in, in uh, Santa Fe who's now a, a writer primarily, but he did, did something where we have these gullies, these arroyos, and red ditches basically <laughs> through the landscape that are not water rarely goes through them. And he did a, a bookshelf in one of them, sort of did, put, put, just cut out a shelf in one and they're just books. So you're walking along the Arroyo and all of a sudden there's a small bookshelf. Now, that I, I find very provocative and interesting. And, and they're still, I mean, I think they finally washed away in a flash flood, but they lasted quite a while and the books got kind of rotten looking and, and it got more and more interesting in a funny way. Um, so I like that kind of thing, the temporary, it probably wasn't environmentally damaging when it did wash away, just a, just a few books. and, and uh, and it was a funny juxtaposition of nature and culture. And, and, but I, I don't, I mean, there's a sculptor in my village who shall be nameless who, who wants to do big things around, you know, and that's the last thing this place needs for my money. So I like little subtle comments sort of in the landscape rather than, than great huge 
things. I mean, the great huge things you find in cities. Cause you referred to plunk art. Is that your yeah, expression? Yeah, that's my expression. Plop art is what it was called because pop art. And I, I called it plunk and left it there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it is, it's a question. I mean, I think it's a question that artists are really responsible for. I mean, like Michael Heiser is making a gully. <laughs> He's made a giant gully. Uh, where in the West, where drought and erosion are terrible problems. And uh, interestingly, his city complex, that's double negative, but uh, his city complex is a huge thing, is donated, the earth is donated by Anaconda, <coughs> which is a mining company. But they've been taking off a mountain, they've been destroying a, a, a mountain, and they give him the debris after they've gotten the copper out of it. I love that. I'm not, not as fond of, of his work as I could be, but uh, <laughs> so, so that, that, that just the sort of double destruction aspect of that is kind of fascinating. But people can make a great case for it being important work. So. Yes. I think it's really amazing like, to bring back this memory also on, like, of an ask over, like that art is not just about like money like that is put into the object. And I think it's very critical today teaching art students when they pay so much high tuition fees mm -hmm. and so so everything becomes much about value and less about the activity and the action and the activism. I think it's really great. I just want to bring in, and I don't know exactly in which year and if it's accurate because you were asking, but the Gutai group did very mm -hmm. early on activism. In, in the outside, as a so in the absence of a museum, I think I think it was either outdoors or in an institution. Yeah, they started very early also to show after Hiroshima to remind mm. us about the preciousness of right. the environment. So I don't know exactly when they showed. I hadn't, you know, actually thought back to Guta because I haven't been doing a really historical. No, this not, this thing of this, but that's that's, that's, that's a, interesting. I will yeah. have to start talking about 55 that. Fifty-five is when yeah, the so, outdoors. Yeah, show. So yeah. That was more like a common. Then I was wondering why is it. The museum, because I think it's interesting. Why isn't what? So skeptical about the museum and curators, because I think, for example, like here, the This Is Tomorrow show that took place in the White Chapel on 56, like when the independent group brought other stuff from yeah. the outside into the museum to discuss it right here to change the notion of what's possible in the museum, mm -hmm. I think are equal important movement. I think mm -hmm. art can take place everywhere in Halloween. Well, I'm, I'm sort of a populist. I mean, it's not a word I use anymore because it's. Uh, become a sort of right-wing territory, but but uh, I, I like the idea of art sort of hitting people up outside. I mean, I, I have nothing against museums, and I think you know, there have been some fascinating museum shows and so forth. But I do think that the institutions tend to sort of infantilize artists who are always on the edge of adolescence in the first place. I mean, it's kind of the role of the artist in society. <laughs> and the, the, the sort of patriarchal and matriarchal uh, caretaker aspect, I mean, curator means taking care of. And artists are, are used to being taken care of, and I kind of wish they weren't quite as used to it, because especially now that things are so expensive. I mean, Arte Povera didn't have anything to do with poverty. I mean, never commented, as far as I know, on poverty as such. But the material, oh yeah, no, I know the materials were the idea. So cool. But I love the idea that, that artists, you know, people now are so used to having some money and getting grants, I mean, <laughs> get unused to it, I guess, with the current economy. But, but uh, people say, well, I, I had this wonderful idea, but I couldn't do it because I couldn't get a grant. And that is not the way it used to be. I, the whole DIY movement, I think, is much more appropriate to these days and, and, and was then. I mean, you know, we, we just did things. And I wonder whether the, um, your publications and working with artists on um, the card catalogues, in a sense, is, is an exhibition site in itself, mm -hmm. and they enter the world in a public way. And mm -hmm. um, um, I brought along Studio International, actually, just to, um, you curated a section of this. And yeah, well, that was Seth Sigalov's idea. I mean, Seth was the sort of genius of conceptual art, the way he realized that you could go around the institutions. And, and of course, I mean, he, he had four artists that he sort of worked with for a few years in New York. and. They were Lawrence Winger, uh, Doug Hubler, Robert Barry, and Joseph Vasuth. And you haven't probably forgotten any of those names. And yet they came in from uh, you know, the side in a very different way than the usual climb from having a gallery show, having somebody write about having a review, then having an article, and having a museum show, then having a catalog, and, and the way that it's, it usually works. And, and I'm, you know, every artist wants all of that stuff, so I'm not putting it down. But, but I have yet to figure out how artists are going to make a living 
if if some of the ideas that I like so much ever were ever to really happen. I mean, it's fine for people where they're in art school, I guess, but eventually you don't want to have a day job painting houses or whatever. You really would like to make some money on your work. So and that is that's something, and, and it shouldn't be a what the right wing calls a nanny state. I mean, I don't think. I don't think that's the answer. So I, I'm not sure quite how artists would make a living in my ideal place where they're all out doing stuff in the public and what have you, or in the streets and wherever. And of course, there's some work that, that only makes sense in museums. <coughs> absolutely nothing against that. I mean, there's some really provocative activist kind of work that can be in inside museums. So. But it, it's just my interest is more in the outside. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, oh, sorry. Thank you very much um, for the, that great talk. Um, my interest is in the piece, the newspaper piece, because mm -hmm. uh, obviously Landau people happen across uh, things, but in a newspaper it's a different format and uh, I was kind of interested about the feedback from that. Well, the, uh, I, do, I have no idea what people thought. They probably thought it was an ad. I mean, I didn't think that was the most effective newspaper. Of course, Hans Hacke, Joseph Kassouf, Steve Kaltenbeck, uh, conceptual art used newspapers too, and, and, and probably in, in a more effective way in some, some senses. But I love the idea of things going out to, to that many people, and, and I, I think it's a, well. I mean, I, you, somebody's going to ask me about the internet eventually, so I might as well. I mean, I am I am a luddite. I live off the grid. I haul water. I mean, you know, so I'm not. I just got email less than two years ago, um, and I finally got water too, but uh, <laughs> from the community system. But I. Um, I, I don't really know the internet as well as I should. I was I kept sort of thinking, well, at my age, maybe I don't ever have to get used to this, and it'll just I'll just be able to keep on making a living. But of course, this weather report shows when I had to get email because right I got actually my next door neighbor to get email, do my email for me, and then eventually I realized I couldn't make a living without it. So I'm on, now. <laughs> but and, and it is such a mixed blessing. But but the, at the same time, there's there's so much that can be done, and I don't. I'd love people to let me know if anybody in the audience is doing activist art on the internet, not just social network stuff, but pieces that actually fit the internet in a way that, I mean, maybe I'm asking for something with thousands of issues, stuff is out there already, I don't know, because I don't surf. I just go specifically for things that I'm looking for, so I don't spend any time wandering around the net and seeing if there's what's it's there. How you find it if it's there? I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if you, I don't never tried this, but Google you know, activist art and just, but I think you'd get more articles and names of artists and, you know, essays and exhibitions rather than one-to-one -one activist stuff. I don't know. I mean, I haven't done it. But if anybody has anything to say about that, I'm curious. I can give you some things to investigate. Because um, obviously reach many more people. And and, uh, and I'm just a you know a if you get person. enough hits if people can find yeah them, I mean even so you probably reach as many people as I ever would with a book with almost anything so I mean my books are not exactly best sellers so. <laughs> okay um, quick question about um, really what you think the role of art is in the debate around climate change and what role it actually has in changing opinions, because you have this sort of melting polar bear type stuff from the Copenhagen conference, but also the blue dot piece, which I thought was incredibly effective. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how art can actually sort of affect people. Well, I, I thought a lot about that. I mean, as a Shabankar battered him in one way is to, for photographers, to go places. And he went to the, the Arctic with Trip TC and made some extraordinary photographs of what was going on out there. I had no idea, I didn't even know where it was, not to mention, but he, he went broke doing this, because he had to hire planes and guides and so forth and so on, but he's, he's going so I, 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 you know, it's, I, I wish we knew more about how people's minds are changed. I, probably the advertising business knows more about it than any of us do. There's a, there's a film out now called No about the Chilean uh, referendum on Pinochet that, that showed how they were gonna do the usual lefty thing and, and 
I mean, I've only seen the trailer, but I sort of know the story. But and then they decide no, they'll do an advertising campaign. Vote no, and it worked. And it, it's quite a, the trailer makes wonderful. I and mean, somebody opens his mouth on television, stick out his tongue, and no is I mean, the no turned up in all kinds of different different places. And um, and that was taking the advertising, you know, strategies and using it. And the yes men in a funny way are, are taking corporate strategies and. And I don't know how they keep getting away with this. I mean, they keep going to these conferences. They dress very differently each time. Um, they get interviewed on BBC. I mean, they've just, it's, it's extraordinary what they can. And then they, they get, uh, then somebody finally says, are you really from Halliburton or whatever? And, and they sort of smile, say, yes, yes, we are. <laughs> and sooner or later, the people, the cops come and whisk them away or whatever. But, but that's sort of an advertising or a corporate strategy. So I think probably, the real question is how do you enter people's lived experience? How do you how do you get in there without their noticing you're in there in a funny way? Get into your head, and Lord knows advertising has done that very beautifully for a long time now. But I don't think artists should just be doing advertising strategies. But they're, it, it's these funny little jolts that art can do from, the, from one side or another, or just asking questions that aren't the usual questions. Mm. Uh, even in a newspaper, I mean, you know, but I, I don't know how you, I mean, in the U.S., climate change, nobody's doing anything about it, including our president, I mean, <laughs> who finally mentioned the word in his State of the Union thing, but, but it's, it's, it's a really hard sell, climate change, because nobody really wants to think that far ahead. My mantra is long-term thinking is in short supply. And then in, in, in the village, I'm always, people say, oh, you can't fight progress. And I say, well, you know, all change is not progress. Good change is progress. Bad change is just bad change, and we should be doing something about it. And it, it's just some, the public is so resigned and soporificized or whatever, they're put to sleep by <coughs> the barrage of stuff that we get. It's, it's, I think art's major contribution can be, and I say it can't change the world by itself, is these kind of jolts, these, like, like oh my god, did I just see that, or hear that, or think that, or whatever. And it's a long, slow process, and artists are not going to be the, the flying wedge of consciousness about climate change. Well, I wish I could say more about that. I, I wish I had a formula, because I'd be out there preaching it. Maybe just uh, two quick questions. Um, in the interview in the book with uh, Anthony Hudek, you mentioned how your trip to Buenos Aires was so crucial for your political consciousness and for the way the work had evolved after, after that. I was wondering, in terms of climate change, was there any particular moment or event that kind of shaped your... Mm. Uh, yeah, I, that's a good question. I, I didn't have an epiphany. It was mostly this friend of mine, Marta Kern, who who's made me do it. And, and then I started reading. I mean, I, I, I knew what I thought about climate change. I wasn't totally ignorant, but uh, once you start reading. And then it was so interesting, because this was, the show was put together in 2006, 2007. And at that point, there were a lot of people, I mean, friends of mine, who were progressive people who didn't really think that this was necessarily real. And, and now, of course, it's much harder to be a denier. They're still out there, but they don't make as much sense as they seem to at the time. Of course, nobody really knows what's happening, but since it's happening so much faster than we realized, than we thought it would, it, it is turning a lot of heads finally. But nobody's doing anything about it. It's just kind of incredible. Okay. The other quick question yeah. is, uh, going back to the institution and the institutional framework, how did you relate to the materializing six years at the Brooklyn Museum? I was very curious to know more about that. Like framing your book within the context of an exhibition and an institution. I was, it was very odd. I mean, I, I, the curators were wonderful, Catherine Morris and Vincent Bernan. But um, they uh, they just called and said, do you want to do this? And I said, nah, I don't think so. You know? And then they said, well, could we do it? And I thought, well, who am I to They can do what they want to do. And it, um, and it was a very historicized, I mean, it had to be. It was, it was a relatively small show, and it took hours to go. I never really got to go through it as... as well, as thoroughly as I would have liked to, because I kept every time I went there, I was only there for a week, and people were around all the time, and so on. So, people will say, "Oh, my favorite piece was such and such," and I don't even remember it being there because I didn't get to see it. So, but it's it's the, the book is really embarrassing. I mean, this is tome, <laughs> and there's something about a book about a book that begins to be 
off into like those mirror images into infinity. Or and also, that, I mean, the, the six years tells exhibition history, and then it turns into an exhibition. So yeah, yeah, and, and then and so forth, and then the book, which was a book, turns into another book, and it's it's a little baffling, but it, but it, I mean, that's the way things happen, and it it, it makes. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to see it getting the attention. I mean, I'm glad to see the, the work getting the attention because I think a lot of people, conceptual art has, you know, this sort of framework, people think they know what it is, but it really was a million different things. And if it helped people understand the diversity of that, it wasn't a movement, it was just stuff happening. I mean, it, how incredibly diverse it was. Not, of course, culturally diverse, because that was another, another thing. You used your preface there, I think, to make an interesting point about the, the um, socially engaged art being becoming accept acceptable, but political mm -hmm. art not being. I mean, that sort of having been left behind in a sense, and um, maybe with a show like Weather Report, mm -hmm. there's a, a drive within you to sort of create the... the well, there are a lot of... I w Weather Report was not the first climate change show in the sure. world. I mean, you know, the, the Kate Farewell was doing its thing, and the Warhol Foundation did something, and... Um, the Stephanie uh, Smith in Chicago had done a show called Beyond Green, which was really a major show thinking about this and so on. This was the first one. I, well, anyway, that wasn't the first to do as much. <laughs> but, but there, I mean, there have been there are activist shows all over the place. Even the Museum of Modern Art did a... I was involved with a group called Political Art Documentation Distribution, which Clive Philpott was... who was a Londoner, obviously, uh, was at the was the librarian at the Museum of Modern Art. And he was one of the founding members of political art documentation distribution because it was meant to be, I guess this is where the archivist stuff comes up. I hadn't thought of that, but I'd been living in Devon for a year and was very, and came up to London now and then and, and was very impressed by the political savvy of, of people who were working act, active stuff in London. And I, I, sorry, I got off on another tilt about the Argentine thing. I mean, I was just very naive. I just hadn't heard artists. Argentina was important to me, and similarly, in a funny way, London. Um, I hadn't heard artists say that they cared more about social justice than making a name in the art world. I mean, it sounds kind of simple-minded now, but, but it, was a, it came as a sort of shock and surprise and so on. Even though I had fairly good politics, I hadn't really looked at it. I mean, to go back to your question about how art can deal with climate change, I mean, I hadn't looked at art being effective in any sense. And that was the first time I thought of that. And so anyway, when I came back from London, I thought, you know, our political art is very naive. We should have an international archive of stuff that's been done around the world, uh, socially engaged work. And so I started this archive, and I, I had called a meeting. I had a, a show called Some Other British Art, which was, I can't remember who all was in it, Rashida Ryan, uh, Okay. Margaret, were you in it? I can't remember. Conrad. Um, very, a, a bunch of, of British artists who I've gotten to know here, really activist artists. And I called a meeting and said, we're going to start this archive. And I said very firmly, this is not going to be another artist group. Because we just sort of, the Art Works Coalition had finally gone under. We, we were starting heresies and printed matter and all this other stuff. So every time we sat down at the kitchen table at that point, something came out of it, and I was like, no, no, we're not going to have this again. And by the end of the meeting, of course, that's what people wanted, and so we had another artist group. And that went for several years, and we published a little uh, sort of magazine called Upfront. And, and, uh, and that was part of, I talk about three escape attempts, and you've heard me do this recently, but anyway, uh, which are conceptual art, feminism and then the activist period in the late 70s and early 80s. And then that just went on. And, and then I, I taught in Boulder for a few months each year, just one seminar, and I could do whatever I wanted. And Boulder was wonderful because I'd, I'd never been at a university before and there was this ready-made constituency for activist stuff. All you had to do is four or five of us would get together and figure out a demonstration idea and put it out, and the next day there'd be hundreds of students out there. It was wonderful. It was not like working with artists. <laughs> not, not as much of hurting cats, and not as much I need to get back to the studio. I can't, can't go out tomorrow, and so on. So that was a lot of fun. We had a street theater group called the Outside Agitators. Which, uh, anyway, and, and Pink Medicine Show. I can't remember where that came from. Yep. What's the Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 
you in the dark back there, yeah. trying to see who. Yeah, it to you next. Um, yeah, I was interested to hear about um, any kind of moments of political change that you've sort of seen or felt part of at different points. Um, and those moments, whether you felt more as an artist in those moments or as an activist in those moments or anywhere in between. Um, and particularly in relation to this, you sort of said at the beginning this thing that you felt dragged back into the art world. And we've talked about like inside and outside. And I'm kind of especially interested in this thing of being inside and outside the art world at the same time. Um, and that in relation to political change. Um, and I guess I'm asking that from a perspective of there's a, a few of us here from Liberate Hate who are a group who make... Yes, I know, I signed yeah. the position. <laughs> so, but for anyone else in the room, we make these kind of unsanctioned, uninvited performances <laughs> inside Tate spaces, mm -hmm. um, questioning the presence of BP in those spaces, and that's very much about um, challenging the social legitimacy that we think that Tate is giving BP by taking his money, mm -hmm. and seeing that um, acts as a sort of uh, a necessary one in talking about yeah climate change and acting on climate change and that actually a, a shift away from oil is what's needed and the social legitimacy that the oil companies has yeah, yeah comes from the from the gallery yeah well that's part, part of yeah. what this recent book of mine is is about yeah so on, and, yeah no I, guess I, I was just interested in that inside outside and the, and yeah. the moments of political change no I, I like the, the things you did in there we we did. Um, Girl Art Action Group used to go into the Museum of Modern Art. We did several actions inside the museum and the Whitney Museum. We did actions. My favorite one, which preceded Andrea Fraser's institutional critique, was uh, when we went into the Whitney and during the women's protests and, and uh, pretended all you had to do was get dressed decently and go in and have a couple of your friends stand around you and they thought you were a dope and start talking. And they just figure you're a docent and so they start following along. And that, that was. Well, yeah, one of my favorite <laughs> internal <laughs> inside and no inside documentation the, and and the no no I mean and and the museum didn't I mean the guards didn't really care who was being a docent because groups come through all the time and so on so we we, we didn't get caught but, you know we just sort of dispersed at a certain point but, but yeah I, I think that's a very important issue and, and it does put the institutions in an awful bind uh, we went through this with Philip Morris in New York too I mean it's it's uh, you know, institutions need money, and these people have money, and they need whitewashing. So they, I mean, it's 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 a system. I think you know. Sometimes I don't blame the actual personnel in the museums as much as the system. I mean, the, the fact remains we live in this system, and we all are complicit in it. There's nothing that any of us can do to get out of it. It's, it's the walls are very high. But we can do as much, we can take responsibility for what goes on inside, and that's what I think the platform and, and Liberate Tate and so on um, have done very effectively. I mean, it, it, and there again, it's, it, you know, the Tate may or may not and probably won't be able to give up the money that BP gives them, but it certainly makes people think about stuff when they go in, like, oh, is that what, where this money is coming from and so forth. And I think that is, if you could just make people think, that's really all it comes down to finally that I really would like people to think more about what's going on around them and take responsibility for where they are and what they're doing. But I mean, I fly around talking about climate change. That's not a good idea, <laughs> you know, it's a, but. I think uh, there's one, oh, sorry, yeah, I, to do. I think there's one final okay. question. Do one more. Two. Two. <laughs> uh, I guess what follows on from that is also an artist agency, um, and particularly this trend to collaborate with corporations, whether they be mining or science. Um, and I'd like to know your thoughts on that. <coughs> I don't know anybody personally who's collaborating with corporations. With ah, uh, I, I think there are, there are many. Except, I mean, exhibition projects. I mean, once you go two steps down the line, a lot of artists are because they're at these institutions. But uh, one that comes to mind is the artist placement group, um, as an example of an independent, an artist or artists going into an organisation um, with some level of independence um, and not necessarily um, instigating change, but, but lifting the profile. Well, it was sort of infiltrating. I mean, I think. That, which is kind of what the yes men do too. I mean, well, obviously APG mm -hmm. was doing it on a completely different 
different level and everything. But it, yeah, that is. But I, I thought you were talking about artists who take money directly from corporations. Oh no, so I'm more working yeah. with. Yeah, working yeah. inside. Yeah, and there are various. I'm going to blank on names, which is an old age thing. But there, there are artists that we all know who've done, you know, stores mm -hmm. and commercial enterprises as art, and, you know, to sort of slide the knife in differently and. Um, and that's that's I, I love all of that stuff. I mean, and, it, it, and I, again, it's really about making people think. So. Do you want to say something? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, just a brief comment. Just just a quickie. Um, um, hi. Hi. Say, is um, it Barbara? Barbara? Yes. Uh, oh, hi. Okay. Fancy <laughs> APG being mentioned. Right. Right. <laughs> Lying below the parapet. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I'm I'm interested um, in your notion of socially engaged art practice, which I think, and you know, your, your attitude towards curating and going back into the museum and out, and, you know. So I, I'd like to ask you about where did this phrase socially engaged art practice come from and what are the component parts of it? Because yeah. I really... Um, God, I, frankly, I have no idea. You'd, you'd be more likely to know than I would. I mean, um, it, it's always, been the term I've, I've used when I want to be a little softer than saying, you know, lefty <laughs> or, right, or right, radical right, yeah, yeah, or yeah. whatever. I mean, you know, this, yes, I, uh, yeah. Well, I'm interested that yeah. you used it. But of course, yeah. I mean, but it, 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 as it was, I think so. Yeah. I think I brought it up actually, and it was a quote. It was an inverted commas. It was um, sorry to yeah, no, paraphrase no, no. it, but I think what. Um, uh, was the point has been made that the expression social engagement gets ba bandied around so much these yeah, days yeah. that we're actually, you know, the, it's it's become... Uh, yes, I agree. And political, too. I mean, it was in the 80s it started, I mean, we had our, our punk period after you did and it was much more bourgeois in the United States than it was here, but, but uh, it, where it got to the point where a political art was considered just a picture of a gun or a picture of a black face or a picture of a, a woman being raped, God forbid, and so forth. I mean, but it was, it, there was no actual engagement. I mean, because that, that really is the key in a way. I mean, there was social commentary in some very shallow way. And people were running around thinking they were doing political art. I mean, they, they just didn't have an idea in their head about what they were doing. They were just making these images. And that's, I think, the worst side of this notion about political art. I mean, I, I was interested because I, in, in, in the early 80s, late 70s, I, I was sort of educated about community arts. And, and also in London, that was another thing that I sort of picked up here in, in Australia, because the United States did not have a very major community arts movement. And how sophisticated and avant-garde and so on community arts could be. Because in the United States, it was always sort of ghettoized as, you know, sort of badly painted murals done with children or something, I mean, you know, or, or political, political things that didn't necessarily make the greatest art and, and so forth. And then uh, Arlene Gobard and Don Adams, who ran something at that point called NAPNOC, Neighborhood Arts Programs National Organizing Committee, which we changed to the Alliance for Cultural Democracy because we got bad knock-knock jokes all the time. But, um, but they, they were, they're brilliant, and Arlene still writes a great deal about, I hope, her name is familiar to you, but she's wonderful on social, cultural policy. But they, they uh, I had, uh, my working partner was Jerry Kearns as an artist, and we were out there, we faced it, <coughs> demonstrating and, and doing the, the general lefty stuff, and, and they came in and said, you know, there's a much deeper movement of, of community involvement all over the country that you don't know a thing about, and they were absolutely right. I mean, it was uh, mo more theater groups than anything else. But some of some of the model of Augusto Boal, who did you know things in railroad cars and started discussions. I love that idea too. I mean, this is an impromptu discussion, which turns out to be art. I suppose now flash things, flash mobs, and so forth, are kind of a take off on that. But but these had political. These were made to make people think again. And this is an artist actually that's involved in a show, Culture in Action, which mm. is a show that took place in Chicago in '93, and was was looking to sort of combine yeah, community the art with Jacobs thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm flagging it because it's something we'll be looking at in a future mm -hmm. book in the series. So. And then Suzanne Lacey's works, which I think is one of the, if you don't know Suzanne Lacey, you should, one of the more effective uh, uh, kinds of performance group, community, whatever. 
kind of things that she's been doing since the late 70s. And I also wanted to mention Greg Shillette's book, Dark Matter, in case you haven't seen it. Uh, it's Dark Matter, the art, art in the Age of Political Enterprise, or something like that, or Political Art in the Age of Enterprise. But it, it's, it's got a lot of stuff that I'm totally out of touch with because I live in this rural community. I worked on watershed restoration and community planning. But uh, of artist groups all around the world doing interesting things that are moving into the culture in different ways. And so, like Volkan Bok Closer, is it in Germany? Well, I'm going to yeah. um, move us on from your book recommendation to my own, which is, of course, the book that we are going to ask you to sign. Just a few copies, if you don't mind. So I would urge you all to join right. us upstairs. Can I, can I ask a question? Can I ask a question? Um, I'm looking for guidance. I'm for supposed to. Where, where are you? Right quick. Go, go, um, please. Thank you. Um, I always associated your work uh, instinctively with the word dematerialization because it's one of the things that um, always I felt so close because I always found there was a strange thing happening. On, from the point of view of the art world, the, this idea of attempting to resist the, com the commodity status was always considered, a, you know, in, a, in some ways, a, a, a failure or, or some way it was a, an attempt too much or something that was bound to fold into itself and to then being returned to, to the community status whatsoever, in any, in, any, in any case. But on the other hand, what I noticed is that since then, everything else became dematerialized more and more. And I wonder whether you know, everything about the financial crisis is about actual assets that don't exist. In material trading, in material uh, you know, financial entities are everything we pinned a lot of our, of our material world onto in one way or another. So I always thought, gosh, we, you gave him such a great tip. <laughs> and I'm wondering whether, you know, we always think that the effect that we have on the world is such a, a strange doppelganger. I don't think I was any influence mean. on that. So, but it's, uh, I love the, the parallel. It's, it's uh, interesting. I'll have to riff on that at some point. <laughs> but that's, a, that's an interesting comment. I have to think about that one. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. And on your uh, note on curating and caring for and housekeeping, <laughs> we all invite you to come upstairs and uh, sign your book and join us. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you.